Yo guys, hope you're good. So welcome back to the YouTube channel. I am here today with Mr. Joe Jeffrey. The big man is in the house. How you doing, man? Don't call me the big man. Don't call me the big man when I'm sat next to the Joe Bowler. God, making me look like the small man. The small man, that's it. He's got his quadruple XL. Hoodie that's on. it, I had to go. It's actually the hottest day of the year, but I thought I'm not sat there in a t-shirt. I love that, I love that. Well, Joe's come down today. Obviously, I'm a week out, um, well, nine days out at the moment from uh, the Ben Weeder. Pro qualifier show she's come down to see me in person, which is awesome. So obviously appreciate Joe's time coming down. I know he's a busy guy. Um, hopefully he's happy with what you saw today. Yeah, very. <laughs> to plan, you know, very much to plan. It, it's always different every contest season, right? And I got the opportunity to peak Joe for multiple shows last year, and that's really useful data for me. But I think as a coach, it's invaluable to have predictable outcomes like how much carbohydrate from absolutely full does it take to get fully glycogen loaded and how long does it take to dry the athlete off and stuff like that and it's very much still applicable this year although you know Joe's a different animal we've got more muscle we're leaner <laughs> um, but it's still good like yardsticks to work from it mm. makes the, the peak so much easier but even with that data I wouldn't want to just peak you straight off the bat like we're still yeah. running a test peak and we're still learning along the way but yeah and it's good to see like all the stuff we did last year how we've kind of fine-tuned that into the approach that we're doing now and obviously that's why we're doing the mock peak so obviously when today is a thursday we're mock peaking for saturday which will then be a, a week out from the show so then we'll see how we look saturday and presumably if we need to make any changes, we will. Yeah, they're, they're just so easy, firstly, to see these changes when you're as lean as you are, and there's such like a disproportionate difference from like being a super flat to mm. super full. It's like we can say, right, at that point of loading, you look your best. At that point of drying off, you look your best. Cool, we got the formula and we roll in with that. And what that also affords you is a lot less stress on people. Yeah. One huge reason why people pull a load of extracellular fluid out <laughs> of nowhere is stress. You know, big kick up in cortisol, stress yeah. stressed about the show, show. Well, they, they need not be stressed because you know you're bringing your best because yeah. we've already worked it out. So we did it a week ago. We know yeah. that shit works. Yeah. So, exactly. um, so we didn't want to talk too much about all that kind of stuff because also we're covering a lot of that in the, the mini YouTube series that you guys are hopefully watching. Um, so today, obviously, we're doing a bit of a and a because Joe is the, the brains, one of the bigger brains within the bodybuilding community. Um, so we're here to pick his brains. Um, we've got quite a few questions through from you guys. I put a box out on um, Instagram to get some questions. So I'm basically going to dive in with the questions and then we'll both kind of discuss it, go through it, see what we come out with uh, and go from there. So hopefully you guys enjoy the information that we're going to go through. Some, I'm going to look through some interesting questions. We'll try and get through as many as we can um, and see where we go. So I will start, Joe. Um, well, as you probably imagine, there's a lot of drug questions. That's cool. We can we can cover them. <laughs> so we'll start with number one. Um, okay, if HDL and LDL are out of whack on TRT, what would you do? So firstly, I'll start this one off with a shameless plug. On Physique Collective, we've got quite a few posts on the forum about understanding lipids, understanding HDL and LDL is both correlative association to cardiovascular disease risk and core, uh, causatory association, so which one seems to be causal if it's skewed outside of the reference range, which one is correlated to um, more incidence of cardiovascular disease risk if it's outside of the range, what to be aware of when it comes to genetic skewing, how androgens mediate a decrease in HDL, what that does to, to the cholesterol efflux. The, the unfortunate nature of this question is that's like 45 minute lecture kind of question <laughs> yeah. where, where yeah. we're talking about particle size, lipids, <clears throat> analyzing lipid buoyancy, and like I said, cholesterol efflux and things like this. Um, what would I do if they were out? Question without context doesn't really have an answer. It's mm. like, what is the reason for it? Have you, what did your baseline values look like? You know, mm. we're talking about on TRT, so we wouldn't necessarily see some androgen mediated decrease in HDL there, but some people define TRT as like north of. 1,500 nanogram per yeah. deciliter kind of test, so we'd have to see what the TRT is. Things like this. So what, what would you do then to kind of carry up from there um, if some of those values were out? Just generally speaking, whether someone's on cycle or not, <coughs> were, what kind of supplementation or things would you do to kind of bring so things slowly back to the The range? magnitude of change that supplementation makes to LDL and HDL was quite minor, mm -hmm. so that wouldn't be like my first port of call, although like it's, it's obviously has some utility. Mm -hmm. but the main thing would be figure out why, like if it has skewed from where it was, 
figure out why and follow it up with, if you've only got total LDL and total HDL or total cholesterol, go and get a particle size test mm -hmm. done, you know? Or if you want a really good view of your cardiovascular disease risk, take it a step further and get an echocardiogram. Yeah, yeah. That's... I, I much prefer echocardiograms that are, and then pair that up maybe with a calcium score test as well. If you want more of an accurate view of what's going on. Awesome, awesome. Well, we'll move on from that one. So, is there a better alternative to clenbuterol? Um, so clenbuterol is a beta-2 adrenergic receptor agonist. Um, you could use something like, when you say, again, no context, like what's the yeah, problem? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's yeah. a little bit difficult to answer <clears throat> these questions. So some of the answers are obviously going to be relatively generalized, of course. I think most people's um, complaint with clenbuterol would be the stimulatory effects. Mm. So if that's an issue, then that will drop off with chronic dosing. Like the actual lipolytic effects via its interactions with the beta adrenergic receptor system won't change. So lipolysis won't drop off, but your almost tolerance to the adrenaline and cortisol mm. output will, so just consistent use could help there. If this individual is like cycling it, if it is that like long withstanding uptick in resting heart rate that's a problem, like you're struggling to get mm -hmm. to sleep, you could consider use of a beta 2 adrenergic receptor agonist with a shorter active life, like salbutamol, okay. um, like an inhaler. Um, you can just use that around periods that you're mobilizing more fat, like your cardio or something like that. But that will reduce the efficacy, like the area under the curve, the amount of time you're exposed to the drug would be less. So that's sure. I mean, the as well. question I often get from, from clients and speaking to people is about with Clen, you know, do they have to cycle it, things like that? Is that a myth? What are your views on that? So what I would say is I've looked hard for data that supports mm. beta adrenergic receptor, either down regulation mm. or desensitization, and I haven't found a single thing. So I'm gonna say, there is no proof to that. There's also no proof in practice. So you're better off literally just, if you're on claim, just run it through. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and obviously we've done that and there's been zero. Well, this is it, there's no proof of contact. Exactly. exactly. Tell me one person that stops mm. having the increase in rest and energy expenditure or something. And so I quite often as well get from clients as well when they've used it for you know a couple of weeks and obviously start to get used to it in terms of the stimulatory effects and you know, the shakes and stuff like that. People often base the effectiveness mm. of Clen on the shakes, which is obviously not um, how it should be done. But again, that's something to show that Clen will still, it still obviously works throughout that, even when that's, like, when those effects stop, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's the, that's what I meant by that first bit of this question, it's like mm -hmm. people mistake the um, stimulant-like effects for mm -hmm. the fat loss effects, but they're, they're completely divorced. Sure. So basically, when you stop shaking, you're still burning fat, don't worry about yeah. it. <laughs> you're good. Um, what have we done differently in this prep in terms of nutrition? So this would be related to, I presume, to my prep. <coughs> in terms of nutrition, well, I didn't have the opportunity to actually take you through the fat loss section primarily mm -hmm. of prep last year, so mm -hmm. I don't know what you've done different. Maybe um, something where the nuance of this prep is more specific and important was we didn't have a very long time from the last show season and we know how like chronic fatigue affects your physique so we had to be mindful of what kind of surplus we could sit in and then be very mindful of the degree of deficit that we exposed you to the other side of that so you have been in a very very minor deficit with lots of diet breaks along the way maybe that's something that you've not done before i'm not sure yeah definitely i think one of the other questions relates to that in a minute so i'll touch on that again in a minute mm. um i know you're honest about using gear um obviously which is uh, which is great how many milligrams do you use a week so maybe we could touch on how you escalate the, the milligrams over the course of, of the cycle, over the course of the prep through off season to now? Yeah, so again, super hard to answer without context, so yeah. I'll answer in Joe's context. Yeah, yeah. Like, when we're talking about somebody in the sport of bodybuilding that is this close to a pro card and chasing it, <clears throat> inevitably you're gonna be working with models that include more risk. Ideally, we just mitigate as much risk as possible through every mm -hmm. single angle, so that may be not hammering a single drug pathway super hard, like not only taking a load of androgens and not taking any growth hormone, clenbuterol, insulin, whatever it may be. Okay. Um, and also just minimizing total androgen or just general drug exposure as much as possible to match the goal. But at these levels, it's like how much minimization of that can mm. you do? Um, it's not uncommon for people, I mean, as you know, to take between the three and five gram range uh, of anabolic androgenic steroids yeah. per week. 
Um, I believe our top's been 2,500. Yeah, I think about 2.5, 2.6 gram, which mm. I've run you know, quite a lot higher than that previously. For it's, sure. a lot of gear. it's a lot yeah. of gear, but at this level, it, it's, it, it's not comparatively, yeah. and I don't want to <clears> downplay <throat> like the, the deleterious health effects of that. Like there, There's definitely negatives to pay for that. But what I, I try to do with clients is the drug use always reflects the need and nothing more. That so does. that's like along the way, we didn't start at 2.5. Like to maintain all of Joe's size and bring off body fat at one point, it was 500 milligram. Yeah. You know, and then maybe as he got leaner, maybe it became six, or not maybe, like it did. And over time, the drug use just reflects the knee right now. Right now, we've got a show next week. So we've been at peak low for what, like three or four yeah, weeks or something like that. Now. Yeah. So there's a very acute exposure just when you. Yeah. Goes. And I think one thing anecdotally from me myself as well is that we started off. Of, well, obviously we had a, we had a cruise phase and we started off from cruise essentially and we've titrated from that all the way up to peak load now, which is about 2.5 gram per week. And over that kind of time frame, as that's escalated up and food's come down, we've like had the nutrition come down and the, and the drugs go up. And I haven't really noticed at all any drop off in strength, not really had any fatigue up until this probably past week or two. Um, where I've got very, very lean, which is, would be to be expected. Um, so just anecdotally, I felt very good on this model and um, obviously visually as well, it, it's worked. And it's been interesting as well, because as the foods come down and obviously the drugs have gone up, my weight hasn't really, hasn't really changed that much, has mm -hmm. it? It's like, come down a couple of kilos, really. Yeah, you've got these like, like two vectors, like the drugs are driving up things like nitrogen retention mm -hmm. and protein accretion and all them things that are gonna lend to scale weight moving <clears> up and then, Next to that, you've got your overall energy balance being in yeah. the deficit. So you've got these kind of two things. And yeah. it can be a bit of a mind fucking prep. Like, man, my weight's made up. Well, your weight was going up for a while. Wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, it was going, I was yeah. going up, getting lean. I was like, damn, this is pretty cool. Yeah. Once I got my head around it. Um, awesome. We'll move, we'll move on from that one. But we're four questions in. Out of a lot. <laughs> um, okay. When you see deaths in bodybuilding contributed by PED usage, e.g. Boston, um, any second guesses on that or any thoughts on that? Any second, I don't really know what it means with that, but I'll, thoughts I'll, on deficit in bodybuilding. Yeah. Um, it's a it's a horrible thing. Of course, um, the the sport is always going to have drugs mm. involved, and it's always going to have drug abuse involved. It, is that literally you think that is obviously obviously we know about Boston. He's quite a famous mm. person in terms of how far he pushed it. Would you say a lot of the the deaths and things we see are down to are some of them just unlucky? There's going to be genetic factors, there's going to be environmental factors mm. to everything. You're never going to be able to say that's because he took this drug for this long at this stage. Yeah. But at the same time, what the bodybuilding world is sweeping under the carpet, you know, well, he was 50 and 50 year olds have heart attacks. Yeah. Like, yeah, sure, but we know that like the mechanisms by which these drugs work do drive things like ventricular wall hypertrophy, and you know, th th there's a, a price to pay for this drug exposure it leads you down that path doesn't it that, that's what you know like you said a minute ago like i'm trying to to be a pro and push things so i'm i know you know the risk that i'm taking and i'm happy to take that risk it's a it's a part of my life that i'm happy to but i also know that there's a, a shelf life on how hard and how long i can push it for to then hopefully potentially still have a you know, come back to some kind of norm. I would probably need TLT for the rest of my life, of course, but, mm. you know, there's that element of, I'm okay with that, but there is an element of how far can you do that for? And there's probably a point where you don't want to tip it over. And a lot of people probably do, right? Yeah, and I mean, a lot of what I've tried to do was show, there's a lot of coaches that use like safer use models and they coach like a few guys that look okay, which is great, mm. you know, but, within the scope of my coaching, I'm trying to show that I can also work with pro-level physiques, <coughs> people that can go to the Olympia or whatever it may be, and there is a safer way of doing it. And I highlight the er uh there because it's never gonna be safe. Competitive yeah. people do competitive things, and how are you gonna compete against someone that's taking way more drugs than you? Yeah. There's a little bit of a misunderstanding of how drugs work there because there's like an inverted U response where more yeah. does more and then it starts to tail off. But I've been on that side of the shit yeah, as well. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is it. So more isn't necessarily more. It is yeah. only up to a certain point. But the, the negative health consequences are going to be linear, if not exponential. So, you know, actually understanding a bit of the science, the chemistry behind these drugs, I think uh, has huge utility. And now more than ever, we've got access to 
blood work, echocardiograms, EKGs, at ho ECG machines at home. Everyone should be monitoring their blood pressure. Everyone should yeah. be taking prophylactic measures like using an angiotensin receptor blocker and metformin. And you, you know, like you've got all of this at your fingertips now. There's no excuse not to be on top of things, but also understand that you're not getting away with it. Yeah, you know? yeah. There's a there's a cost to everything, right? Mm -hmm. Every action, there's a reaction mm -hmm. at some point. All right, moving on. Insulin usage. Here we go. <clears throat> so it's trained going fast. Yeah, so talking about insulin use, um, at the start of a prep, if carbs are still over 500 grams, would you use Lantus or just Nova? Again, I know that's very, very general, and it depends on the person, what their goals are, and all that kind of stuff. You I, I, you probably don't need insulin. No, I just that, wouldn't that, use it. No, no, I just don't see the efficacy for <clears throat> insulin in the fat loss phase. Yeah. I mean, especially if you're a drug user, right? If you're using drugs like... Uh, Growth hormone, mm -hmm. like the growth hormone's ability to mobilize free fatty acids is dependent on the environment. Mm -hmm. um, when I say the environment, I mean like presence of blood insulin, presence of blood dietary fatty acids, presence of dietary glucose. So sure. you don't want insulin hanging around in the blood. Like inherently, insulin's lipogenic, which doesn't actually really mean anything in the grand scheme of things. Like the insulin carbohydrate model of obesity is just nonsense, but it's not going to further your fat loss efforts and. If you're in a deficit, it doesn't matter how many carbohydrates you're eating, your insulin sensitivity is going to be excellent. Mm -hmm. what, what about if someone is in a growth phase there? Mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to say new to bodybuilding at all. Someone who's been bodybuilding for say four or five years, they've done quite a few cycles. They're in a growth phase. They've never done insulin before. When would be the point in which you would use insulin with somebody? We'd have to create um, a dichotomy between the, the two main reasons why you would use exogenous insulin. Firstly, to provide a basal acting insulin to contribute to your own um, pancreatic basal insulin production to take a little bit of stress off the pancreas to give your beta cells a rest. Um, because plausibly over time, you're pounding your pancreas with the amount of food that we eat. You know, our behaviours are just like that of like an obese individual with metabolic diseases, essentially. And we do end up in the same place, like gaining large amounts of body fat and mm -hmm. insulin resistance and stuff. So that, that would be one reason if you're consuming a large amount of food, like let's say north of 4,000 calories a day chronically, it's a good idea to take exogenous insulin in a basal analog for health purposes. So there's no risk there. And when we start talking about risk and we start talking about physique development, we are talking about using insulin for fuel supply efficiency. Mm -hmm like cramming more stuff, you know, glycogen, triglycerides, yeah. amino what? acids, intramuscularly. And what insulin would you? I prefer change? using the rapid acting insulin analogs yeah. for that, so Around I can the work rapid. Yeah. That would be my choice because yeah. resistance <clears throat> training is a vector in and of itself that drives up skeletal muscle insulin sensitivity. Yeah. So your um, sensitivity to be able to drive glycogen into the muscle cell preferentially over adipocytes, fat cells, and would be higher there, so that's where I'd like to use a rapid yes. oxygen analog. And you're so, talking in terms of dosages, a three to five I use is sufficient there. Yeah, yeah. Is um, it is it correct? To, what was it? Ten grams of um, carbs? No, this is unit? crazy. You know, this is one of those myths again that you hear. Yeah, like maybe if you were just trying to stop yourself having a hyper. Yeah. Maybe, but that's entirely dependent on the individual's insulin mm. sensitivity and glucose tolerance. Um, Maybe if you were trying to replace like the entirety of your pancreatic insulin output, mm. which I'm not really a fan of, then yeah, sure, but no. Would you just say go, but just eat, eat as much as you need to eat so that you don't go high? Well, well, if you're eating what bodybuilders eat, in your, normal, your normal meals, yeah. and having three to five IU, you're not going to go Yeah, high who's going nice high? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, on to the next one. Um, okay. Thoughts on bodybuilding pros not coming clean about their usage or categorically denying. Do people still do that? Is that a thing? I don't think anybody can deny. I don't think <laughs> a pro bodybuilder can deny it anyway. Or even like some of the men's physique guides and stuff like that. It's fucking obvious that you know everybody's using it at, yeah. that, you know, at that level, especially at pro level for yeah. sure. Yeah, I don't I think if anyone does it, then. You know, jokes on them, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And if you believe it, jokes on you. Yeah, hundred um, percent. But I think not talking about something and lying about something are different things. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, one hundred percent agree. Because some people have like sponsors and their affiliations that you know, or they live somewhere that's illegal. Yeah, America, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah makes sense. And like, you got to remember that as well. It's it's legal here in the UK and it's illegal in America and other places. Um, okay, moving on. Is it unwise, unhealthy, or bad to have pre workout uh, caffeine every day? Two hundred milligrams caffeine. 
No, you're probably okay. Yeah. Would you, would you see, do you ever see any um, adaptation or anything from overusage of caffeine? Yeah, yeah. yeah there'll, there'll be a degree of desensitization again to the stimulatory effects, like how much mm -hmm. norepinephrine and adrenaline and cortisol you kick out. Mm -hmm. I mean, caffeine is a very well researched supplement that's, that's associated with power output and neutronic <coughs> effect and whatnot. And that's a fairly low dose of caffeine. But you'd have to frame it into the overall. Uh, entirety of your allostatic loads. Mm -hmm. like if you are living the most stressful life ever, you don't get any sleep, you're neurally sympathetically driven all day, mm -hmm. and then you take 200 milligram caffeine, yeah, it's a shit idea. Yeah, like at 10 o'clock at night or something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not ideal. You're not, and you, and you take that amount, yeah. you're probably fine. Cool. So, um, what's the premise to a fat load then over a carb load? What change is expected and why? Yeah, this is a, I get this question a lot, it's like, why would you fat load instead of carb loading? It's like, I don't know where anyone's got the idea that like one replaces the other. We still do the mm. carb load. I get, the, I get that question quite a lot myself. So yeah. Like, why are you fat loading? So one I, think, carb, carb. I mean, when I started talking about fat loading, if you remember, we did a video on this, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. it was like, what is put, this thing? Put a link to it right here. <laughs> That's on you, Loki. <laughs> yeah. It was, it seemed really novel. And I was surprised yeah. that people weren't like, doing this thing and why I'm kind of glad that I've got an interest in the scientific side of things. Yeah. But you look at things rationally, right? What's the goal um, when you're filling up? You want to be as full as possible, right? So how do we do that? Well, what constitutes the inside of a muscle cell, right? What substrate do we get in there? Um, glycogen's one of them, which is why we carb load and triglycerides is another. Like there is intramuscular triglycerides, there's intramuscular fat storage. And if you want to be as full as possible, <coughs> need to eat those dietary fats. And the reason why I like to section them away from carbohydrates is one, dietary fats reduce gastric emptying rate. And can you imagine eating a thousand grams of carbs and 200 <laughs> grams of protein? Uh, yeah, of fat? Yeah. You, know, you feel like shit. Two, we know that exposure to low carb environments over multiple days drives up insulin sensitivity. So your ability to then uptake the carbs. Yeah, load load. potentiate that carbohydrate yeah. load is very high. I mean, As seen this morning. Yeah, well, it's already <laughs> super high because you're really lean anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in, look, you go for pro carb, take yeah, the 0.001% yeah. is that addition. Yeah. I think you, you termed it once well to me when we were speaking before. It was, you said there's there's space within a cell, right? Which you just said there. And even though the glycogen space is a lot bigger than the intramuscular mm. triglyceride right space, that's still space. Yeah. Why would you leave that space? not fill if you have the ability to fill it. Yeah, and it tastes good, so. Yeah. <laughs> and it tastes good. I've just done four days of fat loading with zero carb, and you think, oh God, zero carbs. But we did it at maintenance calories, so the calories are still at maintenance. And the foods, fat, fatty foods are satiating as hell, right? Mm. You've got salmon in there, got nut butter, dark chocolate. These meals have been, I've enjoyed it, man. Mm. <laughs> it's been un unreal. Everyone loves the fat loading. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So hopefully that answers the questions about fat loading. Um, okay. When moving into prep, do you look to adjust food or output first, or both? It's going to depend on where the individual's homeostatically set, right? Yeah, yeah. If they're doing <clears> that, <throat> here, I'll, I'll frame this in a contextual question. High energy flux environments mm -hmm. appear to have greater utility for physique and performance athletes. I'll explain what that means. So high energy flux would be do more, eat more. So if we're trying to create a 500 calorie deficit, mm -hmm. If we could do that with keeping food higher, but with more activity, in general, that's more favorable yeah. than less activity, lower food. So if this individual is only walking 100 steps a day, yeah, move that up, because that's yeah, not yeah. fatigue driving. If they're walking 20,000, maybe we, we pull from the food. The food you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I think that makes sense a lot. I do, do that with my clients as well. It's also like, as well, when you're working with clients, it's got to be a sustainable approach for them. Mm. It's got to be something that they can do rather than me being like, right, you've got, you know, fucking 20,000 steps a day and they're like, what, you do six? Yeah. It's like, we'll make it work for you. But yeah, no, that, that makes sense 100%. Um, do you think periodization in training should be saved as a tool as experience increases or would you use it with someone less in their training too? Less experienced? Um, no, it's, it's not a tool that you should save. You should, mm -hmm. you should periodize from day one. Proper periodization doesn't mean making everything as technical as possible mm -hmm. with this really specific specialization block periodization in these macro cycles. Like just properly periodizing your training basically means ordering it so it's progressive and makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Like it, not periodizing your training would essentially mean just like just training and hoping for having, the best. Yeah, having, yeah, yeah, having like, no real goal it, it, process to do that. In bodybuilding, there's still a lot of this like just leaving things up to chance, mm -hmm. with, especially with training models. Like, yeah, go in there and like, see if you can take a rep. 
or see if you can put the player in there. It's like, why see? Like, why don't we just build in progression models yeah, yeah. that are easily adherable, make sense, and you can <coughs> forecast it? I mean, that's the biggest thing for you, mm. was just periodizing your, that like uh, top line dominant mesocycle design mm. in a way that, you know, oh, maybe I'm only trained with three reps in reserve this week. And blah, blah, blah. Well, look where you end up though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? I think one of the biggest things, I think one of the questions on here actually as well is, what have you, what has Joe taught you that you've passed on to your own coaching clients? Um, but also like to myself is largely massively the management of fatigue and like really how that drives progress in the gym uh, and also in the physique as well because I've been in places before where I just hammer myself all the time and like you know I, I can I like trains failure I can do trains failure a lot but it's I would never take that step back so I'd always end up like you said I'd have so much stress on the body mm -hmm. and obviously when you're running high cycles and stuff and it, you like you said there's that inverted you and you almost go over mm -hmm. over that line and you stop responding so the understanding of fatigue utilization more so of deloads I use that a lot more with my clients now as well definitely um, to, to great effect even necessarily when guys aren't you don't have to wait until someone's completely smashed to give them a deload. You can do it just before. I think sometimes if you wait till that point, it's potentially too yeah. late. Especially if you're working like people that I work with, like they'll just tell me they feel great all the time. Mm. Yeah, and they think they do. Yeah, 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 you know that's why I like using objective trackers to work out like local maximum recoverable volumes. Yeah. Like, are you progressing or was there a regression or something like you yeah. can't lie about that yeah, stuff. Yeah, so it's, it's, you either did or you didn't, right? Yeah, and they sort of like, I feel amazing. I could definitely train for another week. It's like, yeah, you know, you, you actually just like regressed on all of your chest work this week. Yeah, yeah. Like, you, you, I mean, I'm pretty good now at like auto regulating that and knowing exactly when when that period is. But I think as a coach myself now, using that kind of model of um, a programmed or planned deload has definitely worked well for some of my clients for sure. Mm. So that's that's an interesting one. Um, we're getting through these now, to be fair. Um, where are we at? <clears throat> We've we covered insulin. There's a lot of insulin questions. Lantus only on carb load days, and will you stop metformin when insulin is added? Um, so, assume that they're asking about your yeah, I guess so. eight week. Yeah, we did only use Lantus on the load days because we weren't eating any carb <coughs> load days. What did it yesterday? <laughs> yeah, blood glucose management was just fine. And no, we don't stop metformin. Um, metformin doesn't, by any direct mechanism, reduce blood glucose. It reduces hepatic glucose emptying rate, so uh, the rate of glucose output from the liver. So it's contributory to blood glucose reductions um, via how it helps increase insulin sensitivity, but it's not going to um, pull down blood glucose like insulin does. You know? Cool. Um, what first cycle would you run on someone who's reached full natural potential? Could you break it down, please? Well, you'll have to go over to the Physique Collective and <laughs> have a first cycle video that tells you exactly what yeah. you should do, but you know, it's hard to give a one size fits all model, although I do end up doing that on the video. Mm -hmm. uh, ultimately, it's gonna be down to risk and I can't tell anybody what they can and can't do. And like I said, more drugs do more. Mm -hmm. I would say the way I'd like to see most people do it would be maybe a slight bump on what their true reflective TRT is. Like, let's say I'm a kind of upper physiological range at, of testosterone at 200 milligram, then I probably want to start my first cycle at 250 yeah. milligram. That would give me a that good makes sense. additional kick on protein accretion. And I see a lot of people as well now because obviously the I don't know how to word it. The yeah, Primo's become very popular. The popularization of Primo, right. for example, I see a lot of guys asking me, "Can I use Primo in the first cycle?" There wouldn't really be any benefit of doing so. No, well, I mean, even the word cycle, I'm not that comfortable with because mm. I don't cycle drugs with clients and mm. I don't blast and cruise mm. drugs with, with clients. I, uh, like I said earlier, it's like the drug use always reflects the need. So let's mm -hmm. say you're on this first cycle using 250. Eventually you need 300. You might take mm -hmm. that from test. Eventually you'll need 350. Yeah, yeah. You might take that from test. They'll get to a point where you can't handle any more testosterone. Yeah, you start aromatizing at a certain mm. point and then that's when you start the utilization exactly, of other, yeah. other compounds. 
Cool, that makes sense. Also, guys, just a quick one on that as well. Joe did mention, obviously, he owns and works with the Physique Collective site. Definitely, definitely go and sign up to that. I think it's, what, six ninety nine. It is, six ninety nine a month. Six ninety nine a month. That is a fucking coffee. Two coffee. Thousands of hours of videos on there. You've got the forum when I answer questions on yeah. the Ask Joe Anything thread literally every day. So many study links, it's untrue on there. So the value for money is... Literally 1,000%. If you're interested in bodybuilding, which you're watching this video, you probably are. Go and do that right now. Um, so we've got a couple more to go through. Why would you use Proviron instead of Masteron? Um, or can you give some context around that? Depends what the goal is. Like, if your goal was to, let's say you had high SHBG, sex hormone binding globulin, which is a protein in the blood that your testosterone will bind with, and then it, it will not be able to bind at the androgen receptor. Um, because it's already bound up. So if you've got high SHBG, then Proviron has a very high binding affinity for SHBG. So I would use that to bind up all the SHBG so the most amount of testosterone you can get to the AR, the androgen receptor. Um, if you're looking for protein accretion, like more total milligrams that are gonna to contribute to muscle growth, I wouldn't look at Proviron. I would look at more stuff that has interaction with the AR, like Masteron. Yeah, yeah, and what would you, say if you had a cycle when you were already using test and mass, for example, when, when would you then, and why would you put Proviron in? It depends on the dose, like, if you're using like 600 milligrams of androgens or more, like, I highly doubt there's any SHBG that isn't bound up. Yeah. You know, so it probably won't do anything. It might bind a bit more SHBG that would previously have been bound with that test of Masteron, so some more of that might get to the mm -hmm. AR. If you're using lower dosages, I think there's great efficacy in Proviron. I mean, it's a proof of human clinical use. There's like safety and efficacy data on children using it up to astronomical dosages. It's extremely safe and well tolerated in humans. So yeah, that's the kind of reason you use it. Awesome. Um, next question. What's the biggest problem you have faced during Joe's prep and how did you overcome it? I guess that's from you to me. Really, only problem is <laughs> I was just thinking, like, I don't have a problem. I had a problem in a prep. Yeah, this has probably been, I would say, the up until I got COVID, which was three weeks ago. That was probably the one problem, but yeah. it was it was a very acute problem. And that's it? something that was out of our control. Yeah. Because that wasn't because of prep. I just got fucking COVID. I had four or five days where I was like, man, I'm ill. Because yeah. up to that point, I genuinely was saying to people, I was like, this can't be right. Like, how do I feel this good? And I'm this strong, and like everything is so great. And like, you, you'll know if you've done high cycles and things like that before. You kind of just know and you just feel a little bit unhealthy mm -hmm. and not quite great. I just felt incredible, so, so good, just anecdotally. And then, yeah, it's just, it's just been great until I got COVID. And then that kind of set me, once it set me back from a progression standpoint for a week, but just how I felt, I felt crap, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, but other than that, then the problems were all good. Mm -hmm. And I think that COVID thing was even like, a good thumbs up to how well we've managed stuff. Yeah, that might yeah. bury some people. people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you bury a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. Really well. When you're like three weeks out, you're buried by COVID. You're like, oh, fuck this. <laughs> um, cool. <clears throat> uh, how to use insulin and anadrol pre comp? Obviously, we're using Halo, but um, I mean, they're, they're for different goals. Like the, the insulin, I, I personally just like using. A basal dose on very high carbohydrate days again, just to take some stress off. Explain what you mean by basal. Dose? So basal would basically mean like what's going on in the background. So within your own pancreas that secretes endogenous insulin, you'll have an amount kicked out basally over like a 24-hour period, somewhere between like 10 and 25 units a day. Your own pancreas will kick out. That just floats along, clearing up any residual blood glucose in the background. And on top of this, you're going to have meal time secretions. So every time you eat a food that's insulinogenic, it doesn't have to be carbohydrates. In fact, fun fact, the way I still is more insulinogenic than white bread. Um, <laughs> you're gonna get an insulin secretion. This, for the people that are like, scared of eating bread that, that would yeah. eat whey, um, you're gonna have a mealtime insulin secretion that's gonna be responsive to bringing down blood glucose mm -hmm. for that meal. So I like using a basal insulin analog that again is a flat line dosing. Yeah. So you, you, let's say you take the insulin in the morning. Like a Lantus. Yeah, like Lantus or Traceva or something like that. It's just mm -hmm. like this flat level all through the day. It just helps support your pancreas when you're eating an astronomical amount of carbohydrates, mm -hmm. basically. That's the way I like to use it. Awesome. So. And what about um, the halo or anadrol um, effect? So yeah, I mean, you say how to use it. It's like, just take it in respective dosages yeah. and like, would you, so, use it, would you use it with everyone, or do you have to get to a certain no, level no. of condition, would you say? for a time Yeah, I would say this is like acute cosmetic drug sure. interaction you know 
something like Anadrol, I don't want to speak like on data for this because I can't find any, but um, I have feelings that Anadrol has interactions with the estrogen receptor, uh, acts as an estrogen. I've got some kind of data, I've posted this on Physique Collective, but I've got some hypotheses from like data that I, I think leads me to that, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to say that that's a fact. Um, and estrogen does drive potentiate, uh, does um, potentiate glucose loading and fire its interactions with GLU4 um, enzyme production. So uh, anecdotally, Anadrol allows clients to get very, very full, as does Halo, but these are drugs that I would say are situational for like the week of the show. That's the only way that yeah. I use those drugs. No, purely like you say, cosmetic. Yeah. Drug use. I wouldn't use them for like protein accretion because protein accretion is long term. You don't want to use those drugs long term. Cool. Well, that literally last couple. So, gyno on only 250 milligrams test per week, pinning every day, don't want to use an AI. What can I do? Take less. I'm going to say, take well, less. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah, so where is 250 milligram? For most people, that's going to be very super physiological. Maybe yeah. your sort of upper end for you as a genetically unique individual is 150. Mm -hmm. So if you need 250 milligrams androgen load, use 150 tests and 100 primo or mastro yeah, yeah. or something like that. That's what I was going to, just about to say. I was like, could you keep the total milligram is the same? Bring the test down and add in another compound with mastro primo. Though. Yeah, and, and a lot of time when people think they have gyno, it's either they already had it, they're just noticing it now, mm -hmm. or they keep checking their nipples. Yeah, it makes it worse. <laughs> right, manual stimulation does drive up like prolactin and progestin mm -hmm. in the site. Stop playing with the nipples, people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah stop that, it. That's that's more common than anyone would believe. <laughs> Love that. Um, covered that one. How many oxy are you using, Lol? <laughs> Five a day. <laughs> Five a day. Don't do that. <laughs> well, you know, medically, it's dosed um, in some cases at two to three milligram per kilogram per day. So for you, that would yeah, be like three 300, milligram. Yeah. That's a lot of, that's Should we, a lot do it? of we could try, <laughs> might be pretty full. Um, that pretty much clears up most of this question, there's a couple more on there, but I think you know, we've covered we've covered quite a lot there, we've got through quite a lot of information regarding drugs, prep and food and things like that. Um, I think that was pretty good, anything else you want to add on that Joe? No, just uh, as mentioned, please go and download the Physique Collective app. Come on mate, I'm trying to get my residual income so I can quit going to <laughs> Pardon me, right? For, well, for, for real. Depends on you sign up, you can get to yeah, There we go. For real, guys, go and do that because it's a fantastic resource. There's, there's lots of other guys on there as well who are coaches and great brains in the industry. So make sure you go sign up that. I hope you guys enjoyed the video today. If you have any questions for Joe or myself, you can comment below. Or also, um, do you want to just tell the guys where they can find you on Instagram? Yes, yeah, so my Instagram is at Joe underscore Physique Collective. Um, if you want to get hold of me, I, I don't do DMs there, unfortunately, but I've got a contact button in the thing, and then you'll get my personal my email. Joe's too big time for DMs, right? Just, you can DM I'm just me. useless, man. You can DM me, and I'll be his PA. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Um, but respect. Cheers, Joe. Cheers, bro. Nice one. Cheers, guys.